Hello, everybody. Welcome to Women Making Big Sales. This is Melinda Chan. Today, I'm super excited to be talking to Vanessa Dunha-Garmo. Um, she is a communication strategist that has been supporting different associations, nonprofit, education institutions, and companies, and individuals. So she's definitely got a lot of experience, and I can't wait to see how she started, how she was able to get her first client. You know, these are all the questions I'm super passionate about. Vanessa, welcome to our podcast. Thanks for having me, Melinda. I really appreciate it. Yes. So before I get started and asking you tons of questions about sales, could you just share with us your entrepreneurial journey, how you got started? Did you always want to start a communication agency? No. <laughs> so I was a reporter uh, for many years. I, I'm, I'm went to school, got a journalism degree. I was a print and broadcast reporter. Although I do, I did grow up in a very entrepreneurial family. You know, my dad owned businesses. So I was very familiar with what it looked like to own a business. So I was, it wasn't foreign to me. However, I never, I never thought that was going to be my path. Um, so I was a reporter for many years. And then I left um, being a reporter to become a communication, to actually become a press secretary for a local elected official, the biggest county in the state of Michigan. And I did that for seven years and there were things going on and I, I felt like it was time for me to leave. And I thought, you know, maybe I'll launch my own communications company. And I really um, started to create a business plan. I knew I had a lot of connections. Uh, you were taught that as a journalist that, you know, your sources are everything. So um, I remember when I went to go transfer my phone um, I was waiting at the phone store and I was like, why is this taking so long? And the guy, and I asked that guy and I said, I don't mean to be rude, but I don't understand why this is taking so long. He goes, do you know you have 8,000 contacts on this phone? I'm like, what? 8,000 contacts. And I was like, oh, wow. So I had collected that over the years as a reporter. And so, um, so I became a communications uh, press secretary. And after seven years, I wanted to go on my own. And I took those 8,000 contacts and and just started letting people know this is what I was going to do. And I had a logo created, a website created. And, and um, actually my, my first client, I was a little worried. I'm like, well, what am I going to do? I got a phone call from a former colleague. And this is where I got into the nonprofit world right away. She was starting up a nonprofit and got awarded a huge grant. And she said, I want you to produce a video series for me. And I'm going to give you this contract, would you want it? And it was almost equal to my salary, believe it or not, what I was making. And that was my first client. And I got to produce this for five years using youth reporters. It was so much fun. I, I taught young people how to be reporters. And we produced this series of uh, news reports about Detroit, positive things happening in Detroit. And it was so much fun. And so that's how I launched Epiphany Communications and, Com uh, Communications and Coaching. It was called something different when I first started it, but I changed the name recently. Okay. And when you just started, you had 8,000 contacts. That's like, what a network, right? Everybody knows yeah. that your network is your asset, your business asset. Sure. But oftentimes as women, when we got that many contacts and we want to start telling people about what we do, we get a bit nervous. Like, did you get nervous about telling people what you Oh, sure. Sure. I and did. I, I, I was a little scared. I was nervous. I, you know, I was not very confident that I could do this, even though I knew what I was doing. I was a reporter. I understood media relations. I knew, I saw really good press releases, really bad press releases. Uh, I knew what effective writing was and effective communication was because I did both print and broadcast. But yeah, I didn't have that huge confidence. And I was lucky to have um, colleagues in the business who, had pitched to me over the years as PR people that were so gracious and let me pick their brain. And I would call them up and say, Hey, you know, I need advice here. And what do you think I should do? And I ended up collaborating with a lot of these guys over the years with clients. We became friends. We helped each other out. We worked on clients together. And, and so I've been very blessed to have these awesome people in the industry who have helped me out and didn't look at me as a competitor, but a colleague. That's amazing. Building those meaningful relationships and making that uh, those connections and work together to go after clients. Yeah. yeah. To me, it's all about relationships. To me, it's about networking. Networking is using your talents 
Mm -hmm. to build relationships, using your own God-given talents, your own new uniqueness to build those relationships. And that creates your network. And a lot of times when we're in front of connections, prospects, we get nervous. And I love what you just said about using your talent to build relationship. How do you mindset wise, how do you discover that talent? Because a lot of times we lack that confidence and we're thinking, oh, there are so many competitors out there. They seem to be, to be doing a lot of amazing things. Can I really do that? Did you have a kind of strategy or tricks that you can share with the audience, how you are able to find your own talent? Because I find it so important when it comes to building that confidence um, for us. Yeah, that's a great question. And i I'm a big proponent today in using tools to identify your talent. But mm -hmm. even before then, like I even tell clients that I pitch to propose clients, listen, there's a lot of us that could do the same thing. Yes. There has to be a connection. We have to connect with each other. You have to feel comfortable with me. If you do not feel comfortable with me and don't have a connection with me, by all means, go to, go to another company. Mm -hmm. And I think that's first and foremost, you allow the client to feel free. Because they'll, they'll look at these proposals and they'll be like, oh, well, they all do this kind of the same thing. Their price range is the same. And so they're debating on who to work with. Well, you have to feel comfortable with that person. And I, I don't want to work with anybody who doesn't feel comfortable with me and vice versa. There has to be a connection. So I think you really rely on being authentic. Just be yourself, right. yeah. you know, and that's number one. Number two, I'm a naturally inquisitive person. I like to ask a lot of questions. So when I meet people, I naturally make it about them because I just, I'm curious. I want to know who they are, what they do, how they got there. You know, what are some of their strengths? What are some of their weaknesses? How do they overcome them? So I ask a lot of questions about people. And I also listen for stories when I'm interviewing, when I'm talking to people, I kind of interview them, you know? And it just becomes very natural for me to ask a lot of questions. And I'm like, wow, that's a really good story. And then, you know, I offer something in return because I can write, because I know how to pitch the media. I'm like, hey, let me, would you mind if I kind of shared your story with some reporters I know? And they may not even be my client, but if I identify a really good story, I'm going to offer that even that service for free because I think it's a great story. So I think you just have to be, first of all, authentic. Who Know who you are and your value. When I talk to clients, I don't have them write elevator pitches. I have them write value pitches. What value do you bring to somebody else? Why would they want to hire you? It's not because you can, you know, I'm amazing and I can do this. No, I bring this value to you. I solve this problem for you. And, it, and it's about how you can help that other person. So being authentic is just naturally tapping into who you are. I use tools though. I use the Gallup Strength, Clifton Strengths with my clients. Yeah. I think it's a fabulous tool. I have them all take that assessment. I think we all should know what our top 10 talents are. Mine is input and communications. And so I have my top 10 and I sharpen the saw. I use those over and over again to in my business and I manage my weaknesses. I know what I'm not good at. So I tap into other people who are better at those things than I am. So that's a tool I use. I also use uh, a growth mindset tool called um, Well Balanced. It's another tool I use. I started using with clients. And that is how do you identify balance in your life? And that's a tool I just started to use. I'm going through, and I don't offer anything to my clients that I haven't gone through myself. So I have taken the Clifton Strengths. I've been trained in Clifton Strengths. I am trained in the Well Balanced program. So these are just different tools you can use to really identify your talents. Yeah, for those people who do not know, uh, Vanessa is also a live coach. So make sure to also reach out to her. Um, if you have <laughs> any you. questions about these tools, she's not just a communication strategist. She's also supporting individuals when it comes to discovering their talents, right? Yes, yeah. And I work with you know managers and leaders, people in career transitions, people trying to manage teams. So I help them identify their talents too, because you really have to know how you work as a team. You know, you've got to uh, hone in on each other's talents to make your team productive. So I love doing that as well. 
Love it. So I want to circle back to your 8,000 contacts because I'm super <laughs> excited about that 8,000 contacts. So when you reach out to people initially, obviously, you know, 8,000, you're just starting out and you want to get on a call with people. Do you have that kind of process when you get on the call? Do you talk about your company right away or do you focus on asking them questions? How do you get that conversation started so that it becomes a uh, business conversation rather than, oh, good for you. Let's talk next time. And then boom, that's the end of calls. What's your philosophy? No, I, you know, I never, I never call anybody with the intent just to talk about me ever. <laughs> uh, I always call with the intent to find out how they're doing. Perfect. And so when I looked at eight, it, those 8,000 contacts and it kind of floored me, I'm like, wow. And then I realized, well, I've been a reporter for 10 years and a communications a press secretary for seven. So in 17 years, I guess I would have collected that many contacts with the work that I was doing. Um, so I started with the people that I felt most comfortable with, the people that I felt a connection with and just let's, gave them a heads up. Hey, this is what I'm doing. Um, I love, you know, if there's ever an opportunity, if I can work with you. And so I, I picked just few people and I just kept, I made phone calls. I sent emails out to people, letting them know. Um, I did get, you know, I sent a press release. So I did get some media coverage and people called me. I put it out on social media, you know, and that just kind of had a trickle effect. You know, mm -hmm. I started getting phone calls. Um, people would say, I would put out there, hey, I'm going to be at this event. I, I one time put out there on social media, I was going to be at this big networking event. And one guy came up to me and he goes, I purposely came just to connect with you. I saw that you're going to be here. I have a project that might interest you. It was an 18 month contract after that. That's amazing. So you have to put it out there, you know, what you're doing, but you don't make a phone call and just say, hey, it's all about me. How are you? What have you been up to? How are things going with you? you know, um, see how you can help that person. Sometimes those conversations, Hey, even I might, I have a, I want to run an idea by you. I'll be talking to somebody for 20, 30 minutes before I get into what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And that's totally fine with me. That's amazing. And yeah, I love the fact that it's about how they're doing rather than talking about yourself. And I've noticed that a lot of your success also came from working with industry connections, connectors, PR people. You mentioned it a little bit. Did you get a lot of business opportunities by collaborating with other people? Yeah, I'm a huge proponent of connecting, communicating, and collaborating. I think that's okay. key to networking. Yeah. And um, I, I, have, I take a kind of a hybrid approach to PR. I don't have a huge agency. Mm -hmm. I have me, I've had full-time employees, I have a lot of freelancers, and then I collaborate with other PR agencies, other people in communications. When I've taken on bigger clients I can't handle myself, I'll call colleagues. And my clients are, you know, and I, I'm up front with people, and I tell them exactly what kind of company I have, and say, if this project needs more work, you know, I'll take on other people. Like, I have a good friend of mine who's a colleague, he's not only a, a communications person, but he's a lawyer. He's great with crisis communications, uh, okay. uh, Dan Sharon. We've mm -hmm. collaborated together on projects. I had a client that called me that needed some major crisis communication work. And I said, would you mind if I bring a colleague to work with us? They said, that's fine. We worked on that project for a year together. Um, and so I do that all the time. I, I'm a huge proponent in collaborating with other people. So looking back to your sales success, it looks, sounds like you've worked with different companies, a lot of interesting projects. Where do you find, like, if you look at different marketing and sales activities, is there one source of sales activity that brought in the most sales or the most business for you that you swear by? Or is it more like it's a combination of different things that created the success? It's definitely a combination for me in my personal experience. Uh, LinkedIn in recent, uh, recent years has been effective for me. Uh, in terms of marketing myself and meeting new clients. And I try to use that very strategically. And I, I love that platform, actually. Um, so I've used social media. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, we can't network like we normally uh, <laughs> would like to. And I enjoy going to events. I like talking to people face-to-face -face and over a coffee or a networking event. So I miss that. Um, I think you have to be in front of people and connect with people. And um, so, but for me, it's been a combination. A lot of it's word of mouth, you know, people will refer me to other clients. 
Um, and so, but to me, it's all about connecting with people and, and having a relationship with people. And, and some people have known about me for years and didn't call me uh, until recently and say, hey, you know, um, I have a project that you might be interested in. And they've known me for 10, 15 years and never referred me before. I sat on a board with somebody for several years and he turned to me and he goes, hey, you'd be great for this. I need this project done. It's because I was just there and he like thought of me. So mm -hmm. you just, you have to be connecting to people some way, shape or form. Yeah, I love that connections and I can really feel that passion from you, the uh, the importance of building true and meaningful relationship. And when I talk to women, oftentimes, you know, we build relationships, we go to a networking event, and I don't know if it's happened to you, and you start talking to people, but it feels like it's not going anywhere. Or sometimes you get that, you know, no sales, and you're starting to get a bit worried about whether we're doing the right thing. Have you ever experienced that when you're doing a lot of networking event and for a period of time, it's just being dry. And, uh, and then you start to wonder whether you're doing the right thing. And if you've experienced that, how do you kind of overcome that kind of anxiety? Sure. Yeah, that's happened to me. And, and I think uh, patience is a virtue. It's never been one of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so not a very patient person. So I understand truly what that's like. I really do. I went through a couple of years like that, where I was going to networking event, networking event, and not getting any clients. And I was very frustrated. It was kind of like, well, they're trickling in and, you know, it's happening here. You know, I was talking to somebody in the business a while ago, and she said to me, she, she was really excited because she landed a big account. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, that's great for you. And I said, would you mind me asking how you landed that? I'm just curious. And she said, I have been cultivating this relationship for 10 years. 10 years she's been working this relationship, 10 years. And I thought, wow, what patience. And she goes, it was worth it. It was worth it. She goes, and I said, when you say you've been cultivating, she goes, I just made sure I reached out to her every so often. I connected with her. I sent her notes. I made sure to be at networking events she was at. I sent her another trick too. I think Melinda is even if you don't land somebody as a client and you know their needs, I'm a big proponent in sending resources to people. Hey, I had this conversation with you at this event. I read this article. I thought this would benefit you. I stay connected to people somehow. I stay connected to them on social media. I stay connected to them in an email. You have to just constantly be in front of people. And I do eventually believe those clients will come. I have faith that um, I always, I, and I'm very faithful. So I always pray. God, bring the clients in my life that you want me to serve, you know, you want me to work with. We're not all met to work with all kinds of people. And, and so we have to have faith that we're going to connect to the people that we're meant to work with. But you have to be consistent, you know, with being in front of people and connecting with people. Yeah, and I love the fact that whether you're religious or not, having that faith and trust the system is so important. And I've talked to women over and over again, relationship, building relationship, you have to trust that you are building relationship with these people, and it is going to flourish if you continue to follow up. Yeah. When it comes to follow up, a lot of people find it very overwhelming. It's like, oh, I'm so busy. Now I've got to follow up. Do you have a process to make sure that you follow up with people, but at the same time, it doesn't become overwhelming because I'm sure you'll have to deal with different aspects of your business, right? It's not like you just have to focus on sales. You have to do all their things. Yeah. How you, do you have you to do the work. <laughs> you have you to do the work. Out. You have to do the work. So Yes. And yeah, that is really tough for me. So I used to go to this big network event every year and then COVID hit, but it's up in Northern Michigan and it's, it's like the who's who, right? And I've been going to that for 20 some years as a reporter, as a press secretary, and then with my own company. And I always made a point, it was actually my news director in my very first, you know, professional job as a reporter who said to me, collect as many business cards as you can at this event, because these will be the resource, the sources you're going to need throughout the whole year. So I was lucky that he told me that in my early twenties and I made it a habit. So what I did is I took that an extra step. I actually wrote notes while I was still at the networking event, personal notes to them that I mailed when I got home. It was great to meet you. 
uh, was, I love the story about your dog. Thanks for sharing that. Whatever they said to me, I, I took that nugget and I put it into that note. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I hope your daughter feels better next week or congratulations on getting that promotion or whatever it was we talked about. And I would send them a, 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 just a personal note. And that was one thing I did while I was at that event because I didn't want to get home and not have the time to do it. So I would bring these cards with me with, with you know, um, wherever I was at. So it had the company logo wherever I was working. And now it's my own company. And I would just write little notes and I'd mail as soon as I got home. I also make a point to connect with people on social media. As soon as I meet somebody, I'll go research them, connect with them on LinkedIn, say, hey, nice to meet you. And then I will follow them on social media. I will reply to their posts. I'll engage with them somehow on social media. So you have to find a way to stay connected with people after you meet them. There has to be follow-up. Yeah. And, but I love, at the same time, I love how easy these follow-up messages are. I think sometimes we <clears throat> overcomplicate those follow-up strategies and thinking we have to write something very um, special or different. But from what I hear, it's a simple follow-up message of a simple message that talks about them. Uh, it can be something that's completely unrelated to business, but just a simple thing. And I also love the fact that you kind of make that process a lot more efficient. <laughs> For you, writing those messages at trade show was a lot faster than bringing it all home and trying yeah. to write like, you know, who knows how many yeah. personal messages. Um, I love how yeah. you make that part easy. You know, and too, Melinda, I wanted to be um, relevant. So I wanted to remember what we talked about so I could put that back in the note and make it personal. And so if I went home, I'd be like, oh yeah, what did I talk to that person about? I mean, when you're meeting to dozens and dozens of people, there's hundreds of people at this event, you're going to get confused and who said what and what you talked to who about. So I would make little notes. Every time I met somebody, I got their business card. I would make a little note, you know, talked about their last job, talked about their promotion, talked about their dog, and then it would trigger my memory. Mm -hmm. Love it. And um, so you talked a lot about LinkedIn. You obviously love LinkedIn. You've been using LinkedIn to build relationships, especially in today's world when personal networking events are not available right now. I love networking events. I love going to trade shows, but now they're not available. So we're going yeah. virtual. What has worked really well? Well, what aspect of LinkedIn have you really enjoyed um, the past couple of years? Well, I took, um, in 2020, I decided to revamp my whole LinkedIn profile. I ha actually hired a professional who understands LinkedIn because I truly believe in tapping into other people's expertise. You know, I I'm not a good numbers person, so I hire a finance person. You know, I stick to what I'm good at. I stick into my, I stick to my lane. There, there are people who are experts in how to best use LinkedIn. So I hired somebody to help me, you know, really elevate my profile. And then I connected with groups on LinkedIn. And then I looked at, you know, free classes going on at LinkedIn that would help me market. And so, and I engage people on LinkedIn. So, and I do a lot of research. I have 11,000 connections on LinkedIn, you know, almost 11,000 connections on LinkedIn. That's a lot of people to be connecting with. Yeah. So how effective am I connecting with them? And then- don't get caught up in how many likes you get and how many comments you get. Engage people on their platforms. Don't worry about if they're engaging you. I know that, you know, we all get down and say, oh, I only got two likes or only one person responded. And don't get caught up in that. Put stuff out there, post every day, but be more diligent on commenting on other people, you know, engage them on their own platforms. Mm -hmm. And that's a great way to stay connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love how you are always putting other people in front of you, you know, really focus on your prospects. And starting from, you know, when you meet with them and have asking them questions and asking how they're doing, even when it comes to LinkedIn strategies, it's about them. It's about, and one thing you also mentioned is about service. We're not mm -hmm. talking, even though we are talking about sales, but the reality is that we are servicing our clients. We're helping our clients achieve their goals. And the way we see it, it feels not as salesy. Yeah, exactly. And if you, listen, I, if you think server, servant leadership, it'll go a long way for you. 
Yeah. What is it can you do for them? People are not going to hire you because you're so great. People are going to hire you because you're doing something for them. They can't or won't do or don't want to do or don't know how to do, you know, and, but they need it. So you're solving a problem. You're closing a gap. You're helping somebody reach a goal. So you truly are a servant leader to them and you're leading them in the direction they want to go. So when you're in the service industry, you're helping somebody accomplish something. So if you take out yourself out of the equation saying, know your value, know what you bring to the table, but don't make it all about you. You know, I, I remember somebody pitching um, a service to one of my clients, a, a service I didn't do, he was in the finance business, and the client offered to give him a small portion of the project. And the guy was so offended. He goes, no, I don't want any of it. I'm like, wow, that's so short-sighted. I would have taken anything they would have given me and shown them what I could do. Exactly. You know, I'm, I am grateful. You know, sometimes I go for the whole pie and the client says, I'm not going to give you the whole pie, but I'll give you this little corner of the pie. And I'm like, okay, I'll take that little corner of the pie because then I can show them what I can do for them. And maybe eventually they'll give me the whole pie. I don't know, but that's the mindset you got to have. And they will give you the whole pie when, you know, they start knowing, getting to know you and they love how great you are. They are going to give you the whole pie. And that's usually how I've been able to get those big uh, businesses start with yeah. a project that no one wants to take, start with small, maybe difficult projects sometimes, but that's yeah. how your clients get to know you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Love yeah. it. Um, so people are listening, women are listening, thinking about B2B sales, and they're listening to you. You sound confident. You sound like you know what you're doing. You sound that like you're not afraid of sales. And some women might be there and say, I know it's Vanessa, it's Melinda. They've been there. They've mm -hmm. done that. They never have a fear of failure or doubts or- Not true. Or <laughs> not true. <laughs> I fear failure all the time. It's human yeah, nature. We all yeah. have that bad days. And I'm just going to you know, remind some women, some of the women listening, they're just mm -hmm. starting and they don't know a lot about sales. But I just want to kind of have that um, kind of candid conversation when you have a bad day. It could be anything. It could be fear or whatever. You know, um, Do you have any things that you, to pick yourself up? Um, you know, how, what is that strategy to pick yourself up and to feel uh, mentally strong again? Okay. So I'm very prayerful. And so I, I, I really rely on my faith. Honestly, I know everybody's religion is different. I respect that for me. I'm a Christian. So I really pray a lot. I wake up. I, I, first of all, I wake up with an attitude of gratitude. I, I thank God for the gifts. I thank God for the next day. I think, and I always say, thank you, God, for the clients you're going to bring in my life today. And it may not be today, but I go in that attitude, believing he's going to bring me clients that he wants me to serve. So I really do think your mindset has a lot to do with what you're able to accomplish. Now I say that, not that I've been a positive person all my life. I hate to train myself to be that way. I was a person that naturally saw the glass half empty. I was kind of like, oh my gosh, this is never going to work out or this is not going to happen for me. And I had to, once I changed my mindset, and started my day being grateful for my blessings, the, my whole company shifted and clients started, oh, oh, doors started opening up. And, and I really have to believe you have to start the day believing good things are going to happen that, you know, and for me, it's God, God wants good things for me. And I, I believe he wants good things for you. So, and, and, and don't compare yourself. I also was a very comparison type person. Listen, we all have our own talents. We all have our own gifts. My dad used to always say, there's always going to be somebody prettier and smarter and richer and who seems happier and more successful. And he said this long before social media existed, where everybody puts their best face forward, right? So be confident with who you are, yeah. your value, and believe in that. And wake up every morning saying, I have something to offer, and there will be a client who wants my services. Yeah, it's amazing to hear you say that regardless of your religion, I love that you talk about gratitude. 
a lot of times women, and because this is a podcast for women, women, we tend to be very critical of our progress, even just a small progress. If we see other people making progress, we cheer for them, but ourselves, sometimes we become really critical. We think we could always do better. Like you said, prettier, richer, happier, better yeah. on social media, but gratitude involves also be grateful with our business progress, what we have today, the progress we've been able to make, the conversation we've been able to make. And I think that's the first step is be happy with the progress we're making and then trust that this system is going to work and we are going to connect with people, build meaningful relationship with people that recognize our authenticity, our superpower and start working with us. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you're working with women and highlighting women. Because Melinda, I think we've lost a sisterhood in this country, in this world where we don't back each other up. And that's why I got involved in the Women's Business Institute here in Michigan, because I wanted to help other women network, other women build their businesses and their professional careers. We have for so long, and I'm not knocking men. Listen, I'm married to one. I love men. God love them. Okay? I love my husband. <laughs> I, love okay, I love my husband. But I have been in the and the old boys network where I felt not wanted, not appreciated. So I know what that's like, mm -hmm. but we can't um, destroy each other as women. We have to lift each other up and be each other's sisters. You know, there has to be a sisterhood. And just because she's successful doesn't mean you're not going to be just because she has a win. Doesn't mean you can't have a win. I mean, you know, be happy for your, the fellow women who are succeeding that are, you know, doing wonderful things and have each other's back. You know, there's nothing wrong with supporting somebody. If somebody got that promotion you thought you deserved, it's okay. It wasn't meant for you. There's going to be something else for you, but don't knock her down because she got it. Whether you think she deserved it or not, we have to have each other's back. And I, I'm glad you're doing this because I think more women need to su support more women. Yeah, and I think especially for women that have been working with associations, bigger companies, sometimes it can be overwhelming, lonely, because whenever we're trying to reach out to people, tend to be a lot of men. We tend to be surrounded by a bit more male-dominated um, you know, connections. And it's hard to stand out and say, well, how do I sell as a woman? Like we want to feel authentic when it comes to sales. And I do believe that a lot of times women, we have a different touch uh, compared to men when it comes to sales. There's a lot of, we want to feel um, or in our heart that we're doing the right thing rather than, hey, it's a numbers game. Let's go, go, go. And it's about closing sales. We need to feel that yeah. connection. Yeah, I, I agree. We just go into it with a different mindset and that's, we're just made differently. Men, women, and women think differently. And listen, I, I, uh, my husband has a heating and cooling company. I help him a lot. Never would I have ever believed that I had to learn the heating and cooling industry, <laughs> but I have helped him in his industry and it's very male dominated. You know, the, this, that kind of industry that he's in and, and build the trades, it's mostly men you know, but I've gone out there and I've helped them sell. I've helped them market. I've helped them. I've worked with clients. And I just, I just went in there saying, listen, I believe that I know that I know his business well enough that I can help them. And either they're going to trust me or they're not. And most of the time I, I've had success in helping my husband in an industry I knew nothing about. And, and it's very male dominated. Yeah. To me, the key is do your research know the industries that you work in really, really well, whether it's male dominated or not, you know, become knowledgeable. And once you become knowledgeable, that's where your confidence is built up. You, you know, the industry. And so that's where what will help you sell, you know, and, and network with people. And everything can be learned. It's exactly like what we're doing yeah. here is we're sharing that knowledge from our experience, how to sell while be feeling authentic. So if yeah. anybody think you're listening to this podcast and they feel like, hey, I don't know how to sell to these big clients, VPs, directors, owners, like they seem to have big title, you can learn this trade. It's very easy to learn it. And that's the reason why we're interviewing different successful entrepreneurs. And by listening to your story, you're going to inspire other women who are probably thinking of going after these schools, uh, you know, education industries, nonprofit, business organizations. 
organizations, and they're going to be inspired by what you just said, and then go and start building meaningful relationships. Yeah. So I want yeah, to do you for time. Do your research for sure. But thank you, Melinda. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Well, everybody, I hope you are as inspired as I am. I love, <laughs> love this. 8,000 contacts, right? <laughs> well, yeah, so I am inspired to go out and start building more LinkedIn conversation, LinkedIn connections. And uh, I want to thank Vanessa for coming here. For anybody who wants to connect with Vanessa, I'm going to leave her LinkedIn um uh, LinkedIn link and her website in the podcast information section so that you can connect with her. Go right ahead and connect with her and start building a relationship. And I look forward to speaking with you next time. Thanks, Melinda.